morning, church. My name is Krista Gonzalez, and I'm the youth director here at Liberty United Methodist Church. And here at LUMC, we exist to be a Christian community where people encounter Jesus and where lives are changed. And that is our hope and prayer for each and every one of you, that you may experience God's love and God's presence around you today. We are so glad that you've joined us for worship, and whether it's your first time or perhaps you've attended LUMC for years, we would love for you to sign in with us. If you're joining us on a Sunday morning, you can click on the connection card tab above, or you can go to our website and find the guest connection tab there. So let's now turn our hearts to God and worship. We 
Thanks for joining me for the children's message today. Friends, 
Have you ever just felt really angry with the situation and that has kind of made you even feel a little mad at God? I know that has happened to me. The summer before I was in the fifth grade, my family moved from Georgia to Tennessee. And I was so mad that we had to move and I had to leave all of my friends behind and I'd never get to be a big fifth grader in my elementary school. I was so mad. I remember I just got so mad at God. And sometimes when we feel mad at God, we can think that maybe that's the wrong thing to do. But you know, I think it's okay with God. And our story we're going to talk about today is about a man named Jacob who ends up actually wrestling with God in human form. And God doesn't get mad at Jacob and leave him forever. God stays with Jacob and keeps wrestling with him until in the end when God blesses Jacob. And I think that really what God wants from us is for us to just keep talking to God, whether we're happy or sad or even when we're angry. God just wants us to keep praying, to keep being in relationship with God. And, you know, the thing that happens is sometimes even when we're really mad about a situation, which might be happening to you right now, you know, things have been crazy this year and we don't really know what school is going to be like. and We don't get to see our friends as much. You might just be kind of mad right now about the whole situation, and you might even be mad with God. But what we've learned from this story with Jacob is that sometimes after we wrestle with God, after we struggle with what's going on in our life, God can use it to have blessings come to us. Good things can come out of that. I know that I was so mad to move to Tennessee, and then I met some of my best friends in Tennessee, and everything ended up all right. And I'm so glad that that was what God had in store for me that year. And so we just have to remember that even even when we're angry, God does not walk away from us. God stays with us and loves us no matter what, and that God can even bring blessings out of our anger. So let's pray, and we'll ask God to help us with that. Dear God, sometimes we can get really frustrated and angry with our situations. Help us to remember that even when we're mad at you, that you still love us and that you will be with us and help us through anything we face in life. And Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving for your faithful love. Your love never fails, not even when we turn away from you, when we ignore your invitation or desert you for gods of our own making. Even then, you do not abandon us, but reach out again and again, inviting us back into relationship once more. As you welcome us, so you welcome our prayers. We bring them to you with confidence, knowing that you will hear and answer. We pray for the world you created and the people who share it with us. For those all over the world who are suffering from illness, for those who hunger or thirst, for all who are experiencing despair or need, we pray. We pray for our country and for its people, for our elected officials who are having to make incredibly difficult decisions during the pandemic, for the business owners, employees trying to navigate how to keep their doors open, for the school boards and superintendents all over the country working to decide how to keep students safe, for the families and teachers trying to navigate how to return to school this fall for all who are doing their best to make decisions in the midst of this impossible situation, for our neighbors, both known and unknown to us, we pray. We pray for this congregation, our brothers and sisters in Christ, for those who are ill, for those who are anxious, for those who are struggling, for those who minister to us, for all your children, we pray. O Holy One, pour out your spirit upon us, fix our hearts and minds on what is true and honorable and right, Give us the joy and peace that comes from knowing and doing your will. Keep us faithful to the call we have received in Christ Jesus, our Lord, extending your loving invitation to the world around us. God, we know you extend a listening ear to every prayer offered in your name. Please hear us now as we speak together, though apart, the prayer your son first taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, and thank you for joining us for worship here at Liberty UMC Online. My name is Arden Ratcliffe Mann, and I serve as one of the associate pastors here at LUMC. And it's my joy and privilege to be back among you and to get to offer the sermon this morning. As some of you might know, my husband and I welcomed our son Teddy at the beginning of April. So I've been out on maternity leave for a couple months, and I just started back at the church in July. Here is a recent picture of Teddy, so you can all see just how cute he is. Having a baby during a global pandemic is a very strange experience and one that I'm sure will fuel my sermon illustrations for years to come. But today I wanna to talk about how the combination of quarantine plus a new baby interrupted my routines, most especially the patterns and practices I followed to experience God. I'm sure everyone who's a parent knows just how much the arrival of a new baby can completely change everything in your life. But I suspect that most of us are experiencing something similar right now with the way the pandemic has changed how we do things. I used to have a few tried and true ways to seek out God's presence in my everyday life. I would intentionally drive without the radio on in my car so I could use that time of silence to talk to God. When I got home before my husband got off work, I'd use that time alone to journal or pray. I've always had a hard time falling asleep at night, so I used to lie in bed and talk to God in prayer as I waited for sleep to come. But now I'm never alone. <laughs> It's impossible to find a quiet moment to pray or journal or do any of the spiritual disciplines I once practiced. My husband and I are both working from home a lot more than we once were, plus we have a baby, so my alone time is basically non-existent. I don't drive nearly as much, so my daily commute is no longer a time to reflect and be with God. And now I'm so grateful for whatever sleep I can get that I fall asleep as soon as my head hits the pillow. And I imagine that a lot of us are in that same boat. We're working from home more often. Our kids are around more than we're used to. It's hard to get away and, rechar and recharge even on a vacation because it's so difficult to travel right now. It's even been so darn hot outside, it's hard to get out and experience God in nature. Plus, many of the communal opportunities to experience God are denied to us right now. We're no longer able to see one another on Sunday mornings for worship. Our Sunday school classes and other small groups might not be able to meet in person just yet. Many of us have lost the weekly patterns that governed our lives and helped us make space for God in the midst of our busyness. And without those routines, it can feel like it's harder to feel God's presence. I realized a couple weeks after Teddy was born that I wasn't sure how long it had been since I'd prayed. Life had just become so overwhelming that I hadn't been able to make space for prayer. And with all of our lives upended by the pandemic, it's been easy to overlook our relationship with God. It's been harder to encounter God than it used to be. And so that's made me wonder, how do we expect to encounter God? What do we expect our experiences of the divine to look and feel like? Is it possible that God is still with us and is just encountering us in a new and unexpected way? For me, I have always expected God to speak to me in a really direct and obvious way. That's how I want God to talk to me. I want to be praying about something. And I want God to answer my question immediately. Or at the very least, I want it to be really obvious when God speaks to me. I don't want to potentially miss it because I wasn't paying attention. I want to, God to enter into my life and give me a clear direction about where to go and what to do next. So when I think about encounters with God from the Bible, the one I want is one like Paul on the road to Damascus. In the book of Acts, Paul, then called Saul, is headed to Damascus to continue his campaign of arresting Christians. When a bright light shines down on him from heaven, Paul is knocked to the ground and he hears Jesus' voice asking him why he's persecuting his followers. When Paul asks what he should do, Jesus tells him to go into the city and wait. When Paul arises, he has been knocked blind. He goes to Damascus, and God sends a disciple named Ananias to restore his sight and to baptize him. Paul emerges from this experience ready to go out and proclaim the gospel. 
That is the kind of experience I want to have with God. Make it obvious, God. Shine the bright light. Have Jesus talk to me directly. Even strike me blind if necessary. I just, I want that kind of experience, the experience Paul had on the road to Damascus. But our Bible passage for today shows us that that's not always how God enters into our lives. It's not always in a flash of light, but sometimes in a dark struggle that God chooses to speak to us and transform us. Our story today comes from the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis. As some of you might remember from Sunday school, Jacob was the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. He had a twin brother named Esau, who was born just before him. And at one point, when they're young adults, Esau comes into the house, famished after a long day of working in the fields, and asks Jacob to share some of his stew with him. And Jacob agrees, but only if Esau will trade his birthright as the oldest brother for the stew. And Esau is so hungry, he's willing to agree to anything, and is thus cheated out of his birthright by his brother. Later, when their father Isaac is near death, Jacob and Esau's mother Rebekah schemes with Jacob to trick Isaac into giving the blessing Jacob intends for Esau to give it instead to Jacob. So when Isaac calls for Esau, Rebekah dresses Jacob in Esau's clothing and has him wear goat skins on his arms to simulate Esau's hairiness. Jacob goes into his father, and Isaac, who's now blind in old age, delivers the blessing meant for Esau to Jacob. When Esau hears what has happened, he's enraged and vows to kill his brother. So Jacob flees his home and lives abroad with family. Many years later, after he is married and has children and has been successful tending his father in law's livestock, Isaac goes to return to his household, to return with his household to the land of his parents. He sends messengers ahead of him and learns that his brother Esau is coming to meet him with an army of 400 men. Fearing the worst, Jacob sends presents to his brother while also sending his family across the river for safety. He's left alone at night, and that's where we'll pick up his story. Our passage today is from Genesis chapter 32 verses 22 through 32. So I invite you to follow along with me in your Bible or your Bible app. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, that is certainly not how I'd prefer to encounter God. Wrestling all night until God injures my hip and gives me a new name? What are we to make of an encounter like that? I've just honestly always thought that this was such a weird little story in the Bible. There's no preamble. Jacob is alone, and suddenly he's wrestling with an unknown man. Where did this man come from? How did the fight begin? We're given so very few details. And while at first Jacob's opponent is referred to as a man, it later becomes clear that it's actually God in human form who has been wrestling with him. But again, the text gives us few answers about why God might have initiated such an attack. What is clear to us 
is that God does not always come to us in the flash of light. Sometimes God can come upon us in the dead of night to struggle with us until morning. And I do think that it's important that this is an event that happens to Jacob and not to Isaac or Abraham or any other character in the Bible. Because up until this moment, Jacob has never encountered a situation that he couldn't charm or con his way out of. He tricks his brother into giving up his birthright for a bowl of stew. He cons his father into giving him the blessing meant for his brother. When the going gets tough, he leaves town. He later tricks his father-in-law into giving up the best goats and sheep of the flock. When he hears that Esau is riding to meet him with an army, he sends ahead dozens of livestock, hoping to appease his brother with gifts. Jacob is accustomed to living off his wits, to figuring things out on his own. And I think that we can all be a little bit like Jacob sometimes. Here in the U.S., we pride ourselves on being self-reliant and independent. Our society teaches us that if we work hard enough, we can pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We don't need to rely on anyone else. There's nothing we can't do all by ourselves. And so a lot of us internalize that message, and we don't recognize how much we need to trust and rely on God. We get so used to taking care of ourselves and relegating God to the passenger seat that when we do encounter something that we can't handle on our own, it can completely knock us off course. I know that I have been that way, I was always an overachiever in school, and that mindset has persisted into adulthood. I thought there was nothing I couldn't handle, nothing I couldn't work hard enough to overcome. But then my husband and I struggled to get pregnant. It took us several years to have Teddy, who we eventually conceived through IVF. And in that time, I came to realize that there are some things we just can't hustle our way through. There are some things that no matter how hard we try, we just can't make it happen by ourselves. My infertility struggles made me realize just how little I had been relying on God. I know that I would not have been able to survive the pain I felt in those years of my life if it hadn't been for God. I wouldn't have been able to make it through the daily disappointments without the Holy Spirit to give me strength. And I suspect that there are many of us with similar stories. Many of us live like Jacob, relying on our wits and hard work to get us through life until we're hit by something we can't outwit or outwork. A health diagnosis, the death of a loved one, a divorce, a global health pandemic. All of these things come charging into our lives and reveal to us just how little control we have. They reveal the need to rely on something greater than ourselves, and they expose how much we need God to strengthen and support us. And Jacob had to go through that same kind of transformative event. After skating through life on his charm, that night on the banks of the Jabbok, he finally had to come face to face with the one he was ultimately accountable to. He's powerless to defeat God, but also unable to give up the struggle. Jacob clings to God even after God has injured his hip, refusing to let go without a blessing. Jacob's behavior here can be a lesson to us, that even in the midst of struggles, it's important to continue to cling to God. Because if we do so, if we continue to wrestle with God and what God is doing in our lives, eventually there might be a blessing to come out of it. It's in the struggles of our darkest nights that we need to cling to God the hardest. And it can be difficult to think of ourselves encountering God in the same way Jacob does in this passage. We want to experience God in the flash of light and in clarity of purpose, not in a wrestling match in the dark when we can't even be sure of what God is trying to teach us by the struggle. We want to think of God as someone who will nudge us in the right direction, not as someone who will wrestle us to the ground out of nowhere. And yet, I think in the times we're currently in, we might be more likely to meet God in the struggle than in the flash of light. Because there is a lot of struggle going on right now. We're struggling with whether school will be safe for our kids. We're struggling with lost jobs. We're struggling with illness and fear. We're struggling with loneliness and loss of connection. 
We're grieving postponed weddings and canceled baby showers and the loss of so many rites of passage in the lives of our families. And I think what so many of us want right now is just clarity. What's safe, what's not? Can I go to Walmart, to a restaurant, to a friend's house for dinner? Will my kids be safe at school? Will my kids be safe if they go a year without the socialization of school? We want a flash of light from the heavens to hit us and say, this is what you should do. But that might not be how we're going to encounter God right now. Instead, we might find ourselves wrestling with God. Why is this happening, God? Why do we have to make these impossible choices? Will life ever be normal again? We might be more likely to encounter God in the struggle right now to wrestle with all the issues this new world is presenting and to wrestle with God and to emerge at dawn without any easy answers, but with the peace that a blessing from God brings. Because the truth is that God is present in every single one of the struggles we're facing right now. God is right there with us, even when we feel totally alone. And if we cling to God, if we don't get any of those easy answers we still might emerge from the struggle feeling as though we've been blessed by God's presence, even if it might take us months or years to realize it. Jacob leaves his encounter with God changed. He has wrestled with God and emerged both injured and transformed. He is not the same person he was before the fight. After his experience with God, Jacob is ready to face the consequences of his past actions. He meets his brother Esau with his head bowed, ready to accept his punishment, and is instead met with a brotherly embrace. Our encounters with God might not look the way we want or expect them to right now. We might no longer be able to experience God in the same way during a worship song, or in our quiet time at home, or in community with our small group. The routines that used to govern our life of faith might be lying dormant right now or possibly even gone forever. But God is not absent. God will continue to speak to us in new ways. God will continue to break through the anxiety and uncertainty of life right now and fill us with the assurance of God's love and grace. And God will also speak to us through the struggles we are facing. God will wrestle right alongside us when we struggle to know what the next right thing is. And as the story of Jacob shows us, even our struggles can bring the blessings of God. So let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, you are the God on the road to Damascus and the God on the bank of the Jabbok. You are the God of the flash of light and the God of the midnight struggle. In this time of uncertainty, help us to not crave clarity, but rather connection with you. Help us to recognize that we cannot do this alone. Help us to learn how to trust and rely on you. And help us to keep a watchful eye open for the signs of your blessings, even amidst our struggles. In your name we pray. Amen. Last week, we were so excited to host our first ever virtual vacation Bible school. Families were able to access videos of Bible stories every day, along with instructions for crafts and rec games, and it was so much fun for families to be able to participate and worship together at home. We followed the journey of Joseph together and learned through his story how God is always with us and how God can make good things happen out of the most difficult circumstances. Our VBS videos and curriculum are still available on the LUMC website if your family is interested in participating together. Ministries like this are not possible without your support, and we thank you for that. If you've joined us on a Sunday morning, there is a Give tab above that you can click on, or if you've joined us at another time, you can go to our website and click on the Give tab there. We thank you so much for your generous hearts. Will you please pray with me? God, thank you for the many ways that you have blessed this community. God, we thank you for things like technology that allow us to be able to worship you and experience your love and your presence no matter where we are. God, thank you for the experience of getting to worship you. 
God, we ask that you take these gifts, that you multiply them so that we might be able to do more of a transformative work in this community. God, thank you. Thank you for the many ways that you bless us and stir in our hearts today to be a more generous people. Amen. After talking about seeking out new ways to encounter God, we're going to embark on one together now. Back when we can gather in person for worship, we experience the grace of God on the first Sunday of the month through the sacrament of communion. Today, since we're not yet able to meet in person, we will seek out God's presence in the practice of a love feast. Love feasts date back to the earliest days of Methodism. The Moravians, a group of German Christians, introduced the love feast to John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, in Savannah, Georgia in 1737. Under Wesley's influence, it became a significant part of the early Methodist church. At its most basic, the love feast is an experience of warmth and sharing, a commemoration of the early church. At its most symbolic, the love feast is a means of God's grace that is experienced in the fellowship with one another and with God. But the simplest explanation of the love feast is that it is a way to remember Christ's presence on earth and to celebrate with gratitude the spirit of God's love. As we prepare to begin, I invite you all to gather water, juice, or something else to drink, as well as something to eat, like a bit of bread or a cracker, so that you can participate in the love feast alongside us. God is with us. We are not alone. Christ is with us. The risen one has met us, blessed us, and fed us on the road that leads us home. The community of the Holy Spirit is with us. We gather with the communion of the saints in light throughout history and with God's people around the world. With brothers and sisters, absent in body but united in spirit, we pray. Holy One, Trinity of grace and power, maker and mother, father and friend, thanks be to you, O God. You are ever the father who gives us bread, not stones. You are the mother who never forgets that we are her own. From the beginning of life to the closing of time, you are the one who is with us to the end. As the piece of bread was scattered over the hills and then brought together and made one, so let your church be brought together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. You are our risen Lord and whom light has conquered darkness. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Here in our hands is the story of God's covenant of steadfast love with God's people. We are assured of God's presence with us at all times and places, even in the midst of fear and difficulty. Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. I invite you now to serve one another a drink. Without water, then can be, there can be no life. In creation, the Spirit of God hovered over the water and brought forth light. God brought John to the Jordan River to call us to repentance. We are nurtured in the waters of the womb. We were baptized by water and spirit into God's family. Water reminds us of the gifts of creation that God has so abundantly given us and of the love and grace we have all received. So I invite you to drink your water or juice slowly. Feel it flow into your body. Know that God's love is flowing into your body and soul right now. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I invite you now to serve one another a piece of bread or cracker. Christ broke bread and fed the multitudes. Christ broke bread and formed a new covenant with his closest friends and with all who break bread in remembrance of him. Christ was made known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And bread reminds us that just like individual grains of wheat are gathered together to make a single loaf, we who are scattered are one in the body of Christ. Break and eat the bread you are holding. Remember the times you have received bread 
in the act of Holy Communion. Remember those who gathered with you. Remember the presence of Christ. Be assured that Christ is with you in every moment of your life. Please sit silently and allow God's love to surround you. Let us pray together. Jesus Christ, light of the world, you speak to us words of life. Call forth in us rivers of living water and feed our deepest hunger. In trying times, in times of loneliness or confusion, in times that we feel most alone, remind us that we are never alone, for you are with us always. God of compassion, fill us with your grace and inspire us to be instruments of mercy and hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we are living, it is in Christ Jesus, and when we are dying, it is in the Lord. Both in our living and in our dying, we belong to God. In these days of anxiety and uncertainty, may we go forth in Christ's name into all of our interactions, digital or otherwise, as a people of hope. May we be for the world, the body of Christ, broken and shared to be blessing for all. May God bless and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May God look upon us with kindness and give us peace. Amen.
so glad that you were able to join us in worship this morning. Please remember to click on the connect tab to sign in if you have not already done so. And before Arden sends us forth, I have a couple things to share with you all. So the first is confirmation. It is almost that time. Uh, Confirmation is intentionally designed to help students grow in their relationship with God and with others. This experience gives students the opportunity to ask hard questions about what they believe and why they believe it. And as a community, we get to explore the history, the practices, and the beliefs of the Christian faith from a United Methodist perspective. We want students to not only learn about Jesus, but to become deeply devoted followers of Christ. Confirmation is offered to students who are in eighth grade and up, and at the end of the 12-week experience, they're given the opportunity to personally respond to Jesus' call to live as a disciple after the experience. So confirmation will begin on Wednesday, September 16th, and will go from 6.30 to 8, and will extend every Wednesday through December 9th. You can go to the Lumi website to sign up, lumimo.org slash confirmation. And feel free to also email Thomas Cherian if you have any questions. Then we also have Children's Online Sunday School starting up soon. This is going to begin on August 16th, and we would love for you and your family to participate in this. So each week, we're going to provide videos of Bible stories that you can watch at home with your family, as well as activities that you can do to help remember the Bible stories and practice them together. Each month, we're going to provide a package of all the supplies that you'll need for that month's Sunday school activities. So you can go to the LUMC website to sign up for Children's Online Sunday School. Receive now this benediction. As you go out into the beauty of this day, keep your eyes open for the unexpected ways God might be seeking to encounter you. See and feel God's presence in the struggles we're facing right now. And be on the lookout for the blessings that might come from them. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.